Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All coming to you from my office today. And yes, I do have an extra door. That's not a door to the outside. It's just a random extra door. Very old building. Anyway, today I know this is kind of an oddball place. I don't have my glasses, etc. But I wanted to talk about data and about auto labeling. This is kind of actually the last part of my AI Day 2022 talk, and I never really got around to it, but I was watching Dave Lee and James Dalma talking about this, and I was like, you know, we should actually talk about data and why auto labeling is so critical to what Tesla is doing. So first of all, why, why do you need data? You need data to train neural networks. That's an obvious reality of just neural networks. It's the way they are. How much data is an interesting question. And I'm going to get into strategically what you do. Tactically, of course, if you want to have data, if, if strategically you've decided you want data, then tactically you need to figure out how to collect it <clears throat> and how to make that very, very efficient. But strategically, there is a question about whether that's the right answer. So anyway, we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, but the first thing is, if you don't have enough data, there's three kind of solutions to that problem. Number one is collect more data. <laughs> That's obvious. Number two is to duplicate data. And number three is to simulate data. And it seems like Tesla is at least, well, they're definitely doing one and three. They may have in the past done more of number two, which is duplication. So I want to just, you know, bring up like an, an oddball case. <clears throat> um, so, so I don't know, take a rare animal, animal I'm not blank and it's the morning, <laughs> but, but you know, so you have, you have a spread of animals that are fairly common and then one that's very, very underrepresented. So there's very few pictures of it, like maybe a panther <clears throat> or something that's in, you know, in the jungle, you barely ever see it. So there's very few pictures of this panther, lots of pictures of dogs and cats and lions and things like that. So what do you do if you don't have enough pictures of that panther? Well, what you can do is you can duplicate the pictures that you have and maybe alter them slightly so that you end up getting something that represents those panthers more in the group of data. If you don't do that, the, 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 the reality is that at least with neural networks, it will kind of ignore panthers. <clears throat> so when you do actually see a panther in an image, it just will completely ignore that, right? Assuming that there's not enough pictures, right? This is a hypothetical. But anyway, assuming that that's all true, it will just learn to ignore that because there's so few cases of it that it's going to be like 98, 99% right if it just completely ignores that. So it's going to do, that's what a neural network does. It's like, oh, good, I can ignore that thing. I don't have to worry about it. So what you can do is either, of course, go find more pictures of panthers, but that could be really difficult, or you can duplicate the pictures that you do have and sort of oversaturate your data set with that, right? So if you only have 2% panthers and 10% of all of the other things that you're looking at, you can multiply that by five to up it to around 10%. So it's equally represented in the data set. And I know that, you know, Tesla doesn't care about Panthers, but what they're looking at is oddball or corner cases, <clears throat> things that don't occur very often, you know, stuff like that. So what they're looking at is that, and they could duplicate that data. And I'm sure that they have done this in the past. The problem with that is then it kind of overfits, you know, let's take an extreme, extreme example. You only have one picture of a Panther and you just duplicate that a thousand times. So it's going to get really good at recognizing that one picture, but it's not going to understand the generality of what a Panther is. It's just going to have that one picture memorized. So if you take a very, very rare case for Tesla, something that happens only once every million miles or something, Thing, then it it's underrepresented and if you just duplicate that it'll get really good at that particular case but it won't be any good at generalizing that to other times that that happens so that's where duplication is a problematic situation simulation obviously Tesla does do already they simulate their data by uh, by using the Unreal Engine and actually building out things. And they did a whole section of AI Day about that. And that, of course, is near and dear to my heart since I teach 3D animation. And that's basically what, in fact, I, as soon as I get done with this, I'm going to be running over to class and we'll be doing Unreal Engine there. So I'll be teaching that stuff. So anyway, so yeah, so that they can do that too. The problem with simulation is, as James Dalma says, neural networks are extremely good at figuring things out. And they will figure out that something is a simulation and they will treat it differently. Now, it's not a conscious decision, right? But what it's doing is it's looking at the lighting, it's looking at the exact nature of what's going on in the scene. And so you have to get really, really, really good at tricking it. And Tesla's done that. They've created a really good simulation engine within Unreal, but it's still not good enough. So they can't depend on that either. So the third solution is get more data. And this is something that I've been watching a lot of Andre Carpathy's videos 
where he's teaching, he's, he's a very big proponent of big data. And so you can see that in the methodology that Tesla went for. You can see why he's a good fit for, for Tesla's method. And, you know, he's been around since, uh, it was either 2015 or 2016 when he started. But, you know, but basically he said when he started, there were just people with, with uh, you know, PCs under their desk. They were simulating these things. So, you know, very, very low rent kind of situation that was going on at, the, at that point. But what they had was the ability, by the time they released the Model 3 with all of the sensors on it, they had the ability to collect a lot of data. And so the danger with that is that, you know, what's that? If all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. So if you have access to big data, there's a chance that you may not conceive of other options. And certainly there are other options. You could do other things. There might be cleverer architectures. There might be things that are not neural networks that might work. All of those things, the possibility space is very, very open for all of these other solutions. Right now, however, nobody knows a better way to do it than big data and neural networks. So that's what seems to work. So, you know, let's say that, that Tesla solves <clears throat> full self-driving at some point, doesn't matter, say 2025. Uh, they solve it. It's pretty much done. It's a done deal. Well, somebody may come back in the future and say, wow, the way you guys are doing this is super inefficient. There's this way more efficient way to do that. And absolutely that could happen in the future. And it could be a cleaner, easier thing to do than big data, but nobody knows if or when that thing is there. And we're going to get to that <laughs> architectural changes in just a second as well. So anyway, there is a chance that big data and neural networks is not the way to go, but by all appearances, it is the way to go at this point. So, you know, that's the sort of chance you want to do. But Tesla is very, very agile, agile and that really matters. So anyway, why do you need, you, that's why you need data. You also need to have labeled data. And that's a critical aspect of what's going on with Tesla stuff. And one of the things that really slowed them down. So collecting raw camera information is, yeah, it's a big deal, but it's mostly a logistical kind of thing. You have to upload all that information to the mothership every night from each of the cars, and then you have to flag it for where the person was and whether there was some sort of a major incident, which you can tell from the MCU metadata, uh, sorry, the, the, <laughs> the, the IMU, sorry, the inertial measurement unit. Anyway, you, you can tell from those sort of things, like if somebody stopped quickly or something like that, and so you could flag those sorts of moments. So collecting the data or the raw data is not that big a deal, but the way that neural networks learn the best is to have a teacher. It's called labeled data. So basically it's you do something and then the teacher goes right or wrong or you know close to right or close to wrong. And, and if you don't have that labeled data, then it's very, very inefficient at training. And so in order to label data, Tesla has spent a massive amount of engineering effort to create auto labeling systems. And those auto labeling systems are systems that allow the computer to be able to, you know, these, these massive racks, not a computer, but massive racks of computers to be able to label everything that's in these scenes in 3D space. So converts it to 3D space, labels all of this stuff. There's a massive amount of effort that goes into that. But what they're doing is, I think it was something like 5 million hours or something along those lines of, of human effort to label a certain amount of clips of data. And then it goes down to like 12 hours on a computer. And so you can see that there's just multiple orders of magnitude difference between humans doing it. We're very slow, we're very accurate, but you know, outlining a fire hydrant as James talked about, or another car or a pedestrian, and then doing that for 30 frames a second is insane. So they have ways of making humans much more efficient than that. But the most efficient thing is to have a computer do that because it's super good at it. And so that's what they've devoted a huge amount of effort to. And one of the things they talked about in AI Day 2 that was the most interesting to me was honestly the multi-trip stuff. And what that is, is that every time a car drives on a road or gets to an intersection or something, it collects that data and it, it, it can combine that into a, a, a system that works together, right? So what it does is it, I think, pairwise matching and simultaneous optimization and things like that. But basically, it weaves these different drives together. So if you drive like, let's say there's an intersection like this, like a, like a, you know, a plus intersection, and you drive through this way, well, that's great. You have a pretty good record of this direction of that intersection. You don't have such a good record of this way. But if somebody else or you later drives through it this way, then you get more information, right? And so if you get a hundred or a thousand or something people drive through this intersection, you can reconstruct a very, very detailed 
uh, informative map of this. Now, people will say like, wait, that's just the same thing that LiDAR is doing and they're doing all of this kind of mapping and all of these high definition stuff and you're just riding on rails. No, that's not what they're doing. They're using this to train. They're using this to arrive at a ground truth. So in an offline sense, they can take as much time as they want to to reconstruct this scene. And uh, when they talked about nerfs, neural radiance fields, things like that, it's another aspect of this. They're able to combine all of these things to create a ground truth and reconstruct the intersection or the point of interest where they are. And so they reconstruct that whole thing and then they can simulate the car driving through it if they want to, or the next time the car really drives through it, like it for real with a person driving it, it they can train on this, right? They can say like, okay, so this was a problematic intersection. What sort of things went wrong? And they can, they can like, you know, train the network and they could create thousands and thousands of these because the computers are doing it rather than human beings. So it's very, very scalable. That's the biggest thing about having computers do this because you go five million hours to 12 hours, you know, you're, 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 you're changing things around, you're changing the game a lot. So you can shrink down the amount of time and effort required to create this data. And, and then you have the labels and then you can train on this. And then the idea is not that you've memorized this point, but that you've gotten good at understanding intersections like this or complicated situations like this, right? So that's really important. That's the important part, not memorization, good experience. Same thing, you know, if you're an experienced driver and you go to a new city and you see a certain type of intersection, you're like, oh, I've seen this before. I have a pretty good idea what I should do, even though I've never driven this before. That's the idea here. So it's not memorizing. It's very, very different than what Waymo and Cruz are doing, which is basically HD mapping and then driving right down the map. So it's very important to understand that this is creating a ground truth for training so that the computer, the neural network gets really, really good at understanding the generality of this, not that specific thing. So that's very important. And again, this is where edge cases come in because if you have a situation where, and this is where the fleet size comes in, is that is that if you have a situation, an intersection or some sort of weird thing about a road that occurs incredibly rarely in your sampling set, because you've got so many vehicles, right? If you only have one car that's driving around, it's gonna take a long time to go through the entire United States and Canada, which are the two areas that FFSD beta right now and drive every single possible place under every single circumstance. It would take you lifetimes to do that sort of thing. But because they have hundreds of thousands and soon millions of vehicles on the road collecting data, they can collect these weird edge cases. And then they have very clever ways of flagging this and saying, what's interesting? What do I care about? What are the situations where the car is failing? How do we discover those things? And then how do we collect more data? But the critical part about that is that they can then automatically recreate, reconstruct, label pretty much autonomously. The computer just does it. They can do all of these things together to create a data set of the things they want. And that is pretty, you know, earth shattering. <laughs> Auto labeling is king for Tesla and it really, really matters. And I think the way to understand this is to think about, Elon talks about this and, I, and Sandy Monroe talked about this before, but the cost of change. You want to reduce the cost of change. So one kind of revelation that came about from Tesla's AI Day 2022 was that they don't keep all the data. They, they simply can't. I think they have on the order of 30 or 50 petabytes of, of hard, you know, hard drive. <laughs> I'm sure it's SSD drive, very, very fast, but they have storage. And so they have, it's a lot, but it's not infinite. And so they have to keep passing this data through. So what they're doing is they're flagging interesting things and throwing out the rest, but then later on they throw out those things too. So they can't keep it all. So they have to keep moving this through, which means that their data set is dynamic, not static. And if you had to manually relabel this thing, the cost of change of the data set would be prohibitive, both in terms of expense and also in terms of time. It would just be insanely time consuming to change it. But by automating this stuff, they can just, like literally when they went from using post-processed video images, which is like stuff like you're looking at right now that looks, <laughs> I don't know if I look attractive under this light, but but anyway, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't have noise. It, it's it's already been sort of fixed for human consumption. If you go from that to this, the photon count, the raw information from these cameras, you basically have to throw out all of the data you have and reconstruct it from scratch. For most companies, and for most researchers and for most people, your data set is precious. You've spent incredible amounts of time creating this beautiful data set and it's very precious and the cost of change is intensely high and you're like, no, not gonna change it. And what Tesla has done, again, this is, this is I think, if 
any takeaway that you can get from this video, this is the takeaway. Even with data, Tesla is like, it's not precious. It's disposable. We don't care. We can get more as soon as we want. You know, just like that, we can get more data and we can label it and do all of that kind of stuff so that that can be altered on a dime. So when they decided to go to raw photon counts, they're just like trash all the other data, import the new stuff, look at the things that we're interested, retrain the network. All of these th kinds of things can happen extremely quickly. And then, of course, what you can do is you can build a better simulator out of that because you have this data as well with raw photon counts as opposed to post-process video images. And by the way, I think that uh, it's kind of a cyclical thing, right? You can use the data to create better simulations, but then in my mind, you can actually probably use these simulations to create better data. And what I mean by that is you can simulate a scene and and then you can run that simulation of the scene through all of the steps that you do with all of the real world things and you can check and you can go like how accurate was this and you can automatically do that because you already know where everything is because it's a simulation so you can actually they probably have this kind of feedback cycle where the simulation engine it can actually be used to help create better data labeling as well. They didn't really talk about that. That's an assumption I'm making, but it would be a very reasonable assumption that they would have that sort of cyclical feedback thing. So data creates better simulation. Then you run it through the simulation. You run your labeler through that simulation as if the car was driving in there and you check and see how good is the labeling. And if the labeling sucks, then you know you gotta fix some things. So it's really, really interesting how all of that could be you know, done. Uh, the other thing about this is that the lowering the cost of change, increasing the rapidity and the ease with which you can, you know, create new data sets is, is critical to Tesla because what they started doing with full self-driving is they started full self-driving before the current architecture that they're using was even in existence yet. Uh, you know, they, they, at the time, I think it was probably RNNs, recurrent neural networks and stuff, but they've since switched over to what everybody is using, which is transformers primarily, but transformers, you know, wasn't even in existence when they started this whole project. So if you had created a data set that was specifically for one thing and you were unwilling to change it, you can't can't change with the times. So they've been able to change with the times. Nerfs are very, very new. You know, they're able to change and, and update their data sets as needed because they've got the rapidity of that. So, so for Tesla, it's not just the size of the data. It really matters how big the fleet is because you can go and find really bizarre cases, right? That Panther, uh, you can, it's essentially like having a bunch of little cameras set up in the jungle so that you can capture lots of pictures of Panthers uh, because they're so reclusive. So the same thing, you know, weird corner cases, who knows where you are in the world, but some weird things, weird intersections, weird incidents, weird lighting conditions, et cetera, et cetera. You've got all of those kinds of things and you can collect them really, really fast, but then as importantly or more importantly, you can label those really, really fast. Because if you just collect all that raw data and it's gonna take you six months to label it all, that's not a workable situation. So Tesla has created this completely agile data set, which is just amazing in my mind. I, I know this because I collect data, you know, for, for like my own work and it's insanely complicated. It's really, really hard. It's really, really time consuming and it, it becomes precious. Your data set's like, no, 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 please don't change this. And Tesla's like, screw it. <laughs> They're just like, we can change it whenever we want. We don't care about any of that kind of stuff. So anyway, so strategically, so you can see tactically what Tesla's doing, but strategically they've gone we want the cost of change to data, just like cost of change to anything in the vehicle, to be as low as possible. And by making that as low as possible, and by allowing data to be collected really, really fast from a huge fleet, and also to be altered as needed, right? So you can throw away what you want, you can relabel it, you can do what you want, but to label it, to have it there as, as you know, just, just like that, as quickly as possible, that stuff is a complete game changer. And it's really something that I don't think any other, anybody, I, I mean, maybe somebody like Google or something like that in the internet world, because they can collect so much data. If they have that sort of engine behind it, they could do that. But if you think about automobile companies and stuff, you know, th there's just no chance. Something like Cruise or Waymo literally has no chance because they don't have a large enough fleet to be able to turn on a dime and say like, oh, we want to use a new architecture or use raw photon counts or get rid of this sensor or things like that. And, you know, you just throw away the old stuff, put in the new stuff. And, and just go from there. So, so Tesla's agility with their data, I guess agile, maybe I'll title this video agile data. <laughs> Sounds like a good, a good plan for that, but their ability to make the data 
agile to change it, to label it, to do all of this stuff very, very quickly. You saw in one of the slides, they actually put massive engineering effort to make this happen. And yeah, that's the massive engineering effort, but it's totally worth it because once you've got that in place, the world is your oyster basically. Anyway, I'll be interested to know what you all think about that. I think that this is an absolutely amazing kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> world. And I, I, it's kind of mind blowing to think about it. Again, you know, data is the biggest bugaboo for us. We're constantly like, how do we get more data? How do we get more data? And Tesla has basically solved that problem. So again, assuming that big data and neural networks are the answer to this, they are so far ahead that nobody's gonna catch them. The only way somebody's gonna catch them is if they're barking up the wrong tree and there's an easier way to do it. I, I don't know what that would be, but it is possible. <laughs> you know, sometimes people come up with things. But the beauty of it is, even if it's a neural network in a different architecture, so there's like transformers squared or something along those lines, if there's a new thing like that, Tesla can just pivot, right? Just collect new data, relabel it, utilize it uh, as needed for any new architecture or any new hardware changes or anything. So they've got the agility to be able to change. And I think that that is very, very undervalued. So I hope that this video helps with that. And uh, yeah, if it did, please do uh, like it so other people can find it, subscribe. Thank you to my Patreon patrons. And you know, check out all the links in the description, book, etc. Oh, and by the way, I guess I forgot to mention this earlier, but Elon Musk actually liked my shirt. It's on my merch store. Sorry, I can't put a picture up because it's just in the video. But it's the one that says, I appreciate, we appreciate your feedback. Now pay $8 with the little blue check mark. And if you want that, it's gonna be a limited time thing. You can wear the shirt that, uh, I'm trying to get one to Elon Musk. So you can wear the shirt that hopefully Elon Musk will be wearing. So <laughs> that'll be really cool. Anyway, I hope you all are having a wonderful day and I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.